This actually happened a little while ago, but I'm still upset about it. So here goes. In 1994, South Africa glinted with golden promise into the privilege of international goodwill. We were the newest burgeoning bundle baby democracy and everyone was swooning over the mixed little eyes of our cultural diversity as they were opening up for the first time in the unity of electoral participation. Everybody loved the rosy cheeks and pink cuticles of our constitution manicured to be quote, one of the most progressive constitutions in the world, unquote. The brown dimpled knees of our past potential to leap tall civil wars in a single bound was the envy of older, greater nations. Shame, man, we, we were just adorable. And think about the meaning of that. We possessed the quality to be adored. For all our faults and our myth-making, we were worthy of something. Until, in many ways, we abstained from our worth. The best and most recent summary of this sort of abstention on the international stage is when the UN General Assembly demanded that Russia withdraw from Ukraine and South Africa, along with 34 other countries, abstained from the vote or voted to abstain, depending on how you think about it. Not too long ago, we lost Archbishop Desmond Tutu who was one of the best, if naturally flawed, examples of what our country has to offer. And one of the most important sentiments that he left us was that if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. Why? Because that is the party for whose brutal dominion your hostile absence is making space. Here's what our representative Matu Joyini said to justify our decision, as reported here by the Mail and Guardian. South Africa believes that the UN, especially in the context of emergency special sessions, should be used as a platform to build bridges, address the divergence of views, provide recommendations and support for the parties to engage with the spirit of compromise while de-escalating tensions committing to the cessation of hostilities and building trust and confidence." Unquote. Okay, <laughs> build bridges? You can't build bridges if a tyrant wants to roll tanks across them and drop cities on the heads of your children. Conversely, and not to get too proverbial here, but isn't it within the interest of the spider to tell the moth that it is building a bridge when it is spinning its web? Address the divergence of views, she says. Invasion is not a view. Even the concept of NATO expansion, whether you subscribe to its existence or not, is not a view. We are talking about imperialism here. Since when did that become a view for us Africans? One that merely diverges from our own perspective with the politeness, as it were, of a gentle breeze diverging with a bubbling brook. This is war. Be as honest and as loud about it as the bombs that are mechanically shameless to devour people's homes. Because to be less than honest here is to potentially abstain from the human experiment itself. That isn't Eurocentrism talking, that is nuclear centrism. Whether nuclear weapons getting involved or the shelling of a nuclear power plant, risking nuclear catastrophe. Provide recommendations and support for the parties to engage with the spirit of compromise? Right, okay, compromise. So, such as when Ukraine surrendered their nuclear arsenal to Russia with the promise not to be threatened by them? That compromise? or the compromise of Russia having a puppet president in Ukraine and then that president being removed and then Russia annexing Crimea and eastern parts of Ukraine. That compromise. Or how about the breaking of the 2014 peace deal by both sides? That's fair, right? Is that the compromise you're talking about? A compromise of mutual international criminality? 
Or how about Russia re-breaking the 2015 peace deal on the 24th of February 2022 when they invaded Ukraine? Is that the compromise? The only compromise that is happening here with this justification to the UN is the compromise of our selves. The compromise of our values and principles. Whatever of those remained. We are extinguishing the value of compromise with the noxious way we summon up its name. Being, as Martin Luther King Jr. criticized the white moderate, more devoted to order than to justice. Preferring a negative peace, which is the absence, indeed the abstention, of tension instead of a positive peace, which is the presence, indeed the present vote, for justice. But some people will say that this is virtue signaling. As though our justification on the grounds of de-escalating tensions, committing to the cessation of hostilities, and building trust and confidence is not about signaling the virtue of loyalty to the Kremlin. As much as manageable, of course, in order to still sustain some degree of plausible deniability should history try to cancel us over this. Don't forget, by the way, that we cancelled a beauty pageant and our own Miss Universe representative. Because the event was being hosted at the imperialist apartheid state of Israel, who are themselves doing to Palestine what Russia is doing to Ukraine, but in slow motion. Our government recognized the virtue of speaking out clearly and directly in that occasion, when a fake smile was the deadliest weapon against us. But now that it matters with more immediate destruction, we excuse ourselves from the moment. We stand up against weaponized beauty, but not against actual weapons aimed at the solemn beauty of a Holocaust museum. Now Babi Yar now it's bombing. Babi Yar? Yes. The memorial? Yes, yeah. the memorial yeah. which that, that we made we st they started building after uh, 80 years of this tragedy. It's second Babi Yar. That is Russia. My congratulations. How is that not the height of virtue signaling? Others will say that South Africa often abstained in votes like these before, in the past, to appear neutral. Why would we be any different now? First of all, there have not been very many votes like this one. There should have been in terms of condemning the invasion of African and Middle Eastern countries, but there haven't been. This situation is not normal. Whether it happens in Ukraine or it happens in Yemen or Syria or Somalia or Taiwan, who knows? It's not normal and it should not be. Snap out of that confusion. Second point, what did these people have to say about Switzerland? The royal house of neutrality who took some stand against Russia's actions. And if Switzerland's greater economic freedom than our own is the reason why you think they can afford to get away with something like that, how then do you explain the fact that most countries who are part of the non-alignment movement like our continental neighbors, most of those African nations that participated voted in favor to condemn Russia for her actions, as well as demand her immediate withdrawal from Imita Yomnyumtana Bituna, proving that you can be neutral and still call a spade a spade in such occasions. And also, again, proving the economic freedom argument a fallacy as we all know that that is lacking across Africa. Yet, many of our neighbors still stood on principle. And it also, also, point number three, disproves the notion that I, or anybody else who's condemning Russia's aggression here, is in support of NATO. Since, again, most African countries are members of the non-alignment agreement, made specifically not to take sides in the squabbles of so-called Cold War international power blocks. The point here overall defeats three bad excuses. 
Then others will say, yes, our fellow African sister countries stood up, but they were doing it for their own interests, their own trade relations. It's all power realism 101. It's just about power. To which my response would be to ask, pray tell, exactly what sort of calculations are we making where softly condoning imperialism works to our benefit while condemning imperialism works against us as Africans? When did we turn that corner? Why didn't our fellow formerly, formerly colonized neighbors also get this exact same answer? Hmm? Do we just not do our homework on this and are now just copying the notes of the Dutch East India Company? Now I wonder what we're doing in Mozambique which also abstained. In something resembling a conclusion, we get the following words from Ms. Joini, quote, we strongly urge all sides to uphold international humanitarian human rights law and principles of the UN Charter, including sovereignty and territorial integrity, unquote. You just breathed a sigh of relief at that last sentiment, didn't you? the urging that parties uphold sovereignty and territorial integrity. And the reason you experienced some relief at that sentiment is because that last statement is cleverly constructed to appease everybody. If you condemn Russia, then you hear the words uphold sovereignty. And if you're on the Russia side of things, you hear the sentiment, yes, NATO, allow Putin some territorial integrity. Crimea and the separatist East are independent territories. That's what we meant by compromise. And even if it's meant only to be understood according to the first interpretation, it still doesn't change the fact that we abstained from the vote at the end of that very long day. Suggesting that we are hypocrites that do not actually possess the courage of our own convictions. What we have done here is not just abstain from a vote, but possibly we have abstained from the membership and the momentum of moral history itself. Something which, if you look at the political and economic condition of our country, we have been doing locally for a while now, having been recently crowned the most unequal country in the world. For the 21st time now, our moral maladministration is old enough to drink now, everywhere in the world. Perhaps it was time then that we went international. It's a cold night ahead of us, one which we had better hope stays cold because that's the best outcome we can hope for in this situation. And I, I am, well, what do I even say? Do you know how you feel right now? If you're still trying to figure it out, you're going to have to figure it out for, yeah.